This story is based on official reports and eyewitness accounts. And this is the story of Burgen Air Flight 301. Gregorio Luperon Airport, Puerto Plata, Dominican Republic. During the evening of February 6, 1996, Bergen Air Flight 301 is preparing on a transatlantic journey to Frankfurt in Germany with stopovers in Gander in Canada and Berlin. Bergen Air is an Istanbul-based Turkish charter carrier that commenced operations in 1988. The airline have close relationships with tour operators in Germany and the Dominican Republic. Its first aircraft was a Douglas DC-8, although it later added aircraft from various Boeing. Among these are two Boeing 757-200. The aircraft was an 11 years old Boeing 757 and registered as Tango Charlie Golf Echo November. The 757 was a modern aircraft in 1996 and it had an excellent safety record. However this Boeing 757 had been on the ground for the 20 days before the flight. The crew consisted of 11 Turks and 2 Dominicans. On this night 3 Turkish pilots were in the cockpit. The captain was 61 year old Ahmet Erdem one of Bergenair's most experienced pilots. Throughout his career, Ahmet had accumulated 24,000 hours of flight time in various aircraft. By this point, he had nearly 2,000 hours of experience on the Boeing 757. The first officer, 34-year-old Akit Jurgen, he had 3,500 hours of flying experience, significantly less than the captain. In fact, he had only logged 71 hours flying the 757. Behind the pilots for the lengthy journey was the relief captain, 51-year-old Muli Zevrenisoglu. He had 15,000 hours of flight time, but was very new to the 757, with just over 100 hours on the aircraft. Flight 301 had 176 passengers and 13 crew members. The majority of the passengers were German vacationers returning from a Caribbean holiday package, with nine Poles also on board, including two members of the Polish parliament. Flight 301 pushed back from the gate at Porta Plata at just after half past 11 local time. The 176 passengers were ready for the lengthy trip. The takeoff of Virgin Air Flight 301 began at 2342. As the plane gains speed for takeoff, light rain starts to fall. Each pilot on the aircraft had a ground speed indicator. The first officer checks his airspeed indicator as part of a routine instrument check. When the aircraft reached 80 knots or 150 kilometers per hour, the first officer made the standard announcement of 80 knots. The purpose of this is to ensure that both pilots' airspeed indicators display the same reading. The captain discovers that it is not functioning properly. Mismatched airspeed readings are a serious issue and can lead to a boarding takeoff. Despite the malfunction, the captain decides to proceed with takeoff. Instead, he asks the first officer to inform him when the aircraft reaches takeoff speed. At 150 knots, the Boeing reaches V1, the point beyond which takeoff cannot be safely aborted. First officer, V1 rotate. The captain took off and started ascending above the Atlantic Ocean. Let's take a short break. We've put a lot of effort into this video, and if you find it useful and informative, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Your support helps us bring you more great content. Thanks for watching. A few seconds after takeoff, as the plane climbed to 500 feet, the captain noticed that his airspeed indicator was starting to move and informed the first officer. The captain believed that everything was now back to normal. One minute and 30 seconds into the flight, the autopilot was activated by the crew. The problem reappeared after being thought to be fixed. The captain's airspeed indicator read 350 knot. Speed is a critical parameter for an aircraft, and that's why there were a total of five separate speed indications in this cockpit. Although the captain's wasn't functioning, there was also the first officer's airspeed indicator. However, the autopilot, which was receiving its airspeed information from the same equipment, that was providing incorrect readings to the captain's airspeed indicator. The plane's computer believed that it was going at a high speed. The plane was not actually flying at a high speed. The computer simply thought it was, as it was receiving its speed readings from the captain's faulty airspeed indicator. The autopilot automatically increased the pitch-up angle and reduced power, causing the plane's airspeed to decrease. The captain then noticed that his airspeed indicator was displaying an abnormally high reading, 
and informed the first officer about the high reading on his airspeed indicator. The situation in the cockpit became more complex as the first officer's airspeed indicator indicated that the plane was flying too slowly. The crew decided to reset the circuit breakers responsible for the captain's airspeed readings. When the relief pilot reset the circuit breakers, the plane began giving multiple, contradictory visual and audible warnings indicating that it was flying too fast. During all of this, the autopilot was still in control of the aircraft. The autopilot reached the limits of its programming and shut off. The crew was alerted by an overspeed warning that they were nearing the maximum speed of 350 knots. The relief pilot once again resets the circuit breakers. The act of resetting the circuit breakers stops the alarm, but it doesn't resolve the issue. While the pilots were resetting the circuit breakers and mistakenly identifying their issue, the speed of the aircraft was gradually decreasing. The captain's speed indicator still indicates that the aircraft is flying too fast. Confused by the conflicting readings, the captain decides to decrease the engine's power to slow down the aircraft. The act of reducing the thrust results in an immediate activation of the plane's stick shaker stall alert. The aircraft was alerting the crew that it was going to stall and potentially crash as a result. The crew's confusion increases as the aircraft starts to shake. The plane started to descend because the wings were not getting enough airflow. Both the co-pilot and relief pilot seem to have noticed the stall that is approaching and are attempting to inform the captain. But they do not take direct action possibly due to respect for the captain's advanced age and extensive experience. The plane had lost 2,000 feet in altitude and was rapidly descending towards the sea. The actual cockpit voice recording from the flight is presented below. The captain attempts to overcome the stall by maximizing the plane's thrust, but it doesn't help. The left engine fails, causing the aircraft to spin out of control due to the unbalanced power from the still-functioning right engine. A short time later, the plane turns upside down. At 11.47 p.m. that night, the ground proximity warning system gives an audible warning, and a few seconds later, the plane crashes into the Atlantic Ocean. All 189 people aboard the plane died instantly. The Dominican Republic government's General Directorate of Civil Aviation initiated an investigation immediately following the crash. Three weeks after the accident, the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder were retrieved from the depths of the ocean. The investigators found that one of the three pitot tubes, used to measure airspeed, was blocked. Pitot tubes are cylindrical and made of metal, extending out from the aircraft's fuselage and are used to determine the speed of the plane through the air. Since none of the pitot tubes were found, investigators were unable to definitively determine the cause of the blockage. The aircraft had been parked at Puerto Plata for 20 days prior to the accident. During this extended ground time, it is standard procedure to cover the pitot tubes. However, during this period, the pitot tubes were left uncovered for some time. The investigators think that the black and yellow mud dauber is the most probable cause. The black and yellow mud dauber is a species of solitary sphecid wasp that is commonly known by Dominican pilots. This type of wasp often builds its nests in cylindrical structures or creates its own cylindrical nests from mud. The CEO of Bergenaire stated that the pito covers were taken off two days prior to the accident for the purpose of conducting an engine test run. Apparently, the two-day period provided enough time for the wasps to build nests inside the tubes. The investigators noted several other factors and recommended changes. The investigators said the pilots should have followed procedures and stopped the takeoff when they saw a big difference in the airspeed readings. Experienced pilots in simulations had trouble understanding the warnings because the overspeed horn and stick shaker gave confusing messages at the same time during flight. As a result, the Federal Aviation Administration directed that pilot training must now include a scenario about a blocked pitot tube. 
The FAA's research also revealed that the situation resulted in multiple contradictory warning sounds and warning lights, which added to the pilot's workload and made flying the aircraft more challenging. The FAA requested that Boeing modify some of the warnings and introduce a new warning to notify both pilots of a disagreement between their instruments. In addition, the FAA made a request to Boeing to enhance the system by giving the pilots the ability to turn off alarms and choose which pitot tube the autopilot will use to measure airspeed. The crash of Flight 301 resulted in a rapid decline in the image and financial health of the airline, causing some of its planes to be grounded. The accident led to concerns about safety, causing a drop in passenger numbers and ultimately leading to Bergen Air's bankruptcy in October of the same year. In memory of the 189 people who lost their lives in the Bergen Air Flight 301 tragedy.